Hello everyone, I'm Shannon Moreau with Tax Analyst. Thank you for joining us today for the latest installment in our weekly discussion on tax reform. Now today we are broadcasting live from Capitol Hill for a legislative update on tax reform. So there's been a lot of talk about tax reform ever since uh, President Trump's administration took office and, and previous to that as well, especially after the first attempt at health care failed. Now, there's been a lot of conflicting reports about will they try health care again? It looks like they will. Um, and then what does that do for the current timeline of tax reform? Is it still going to happen? When will it happen? So to help us with all that confusion and to wade through those details, I am joined today by tax analyst Capitol Hill staff, Stephen Cooper, who is our senior reporter, and Dylan Morosis, who is our also reporter. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having you both. I, we're so happy to have you both on here and uh, help us with all the confusion. There's really been a lot to talk about. So to start off, Dylan, if you don't mind, um, it seems that Congress has been is going to take a second crack at health care, like we previously mentioned. And um, that was really surprising to a lot of people. It was surprising to me because it was really widely assumed that once, you know, the previous health care bill failed, that everyone would move on to the next priority and tax reform would take center stage again. Mm -hmm. um, so now that that doesn't seem to be happening, do you think that that has anything to do with the baseline for revenue neutrality? And can you explain how that works? Sure. Um, so I'll start with something that, that House Speaker Paul Ryan has said in the past at uh, several events. Uh, he, he has said that by eliminating the several uh, taxes associated with the Affordable Care Act, mm -hmm. it would result in making tax reform legislation a trillion dollars easier. So what he's basically saying is that uh, those, those taxes associated with the Affordable Care Act uh, is about it amounts to about a trillion dollars. There's several taxes in there. There's the, the medical device excise tax. There's a 40 percent um, excise tax on high cost health plans, also known as the, the Cadillac tax, more pop popularly mm -hmm. known as the, uh, the Cadillac tax. But there's also some other taxes not necessarily medically focused. There's the, the 3.9 um, percent net investment tax on, on high income earners. Sure. So, so that all amounts to about a trillion dollars. And that in, in, in turn re reduces the baseline, the federal budget baseline, which means that tax reform would only, it would basically have to raise about a trillion dollars less. Makes it easier. Right. Makes In order sense. to be budget neutral. Right, exactly. Gotcha. Okay, so we were just talking about the different tax measures that are in the ACA. We talked about the medical device tax, and you mentioned the supplemental um, tax net investment income. So the GOP has been on record as being strongly opposed to those taxes, mm -hmm. but it's really not clear how they intend to address them. Um, and at this point, what is more likely, what do you think, Scoop, um, that Congress will eliminate those taxes as part of a tax reform bill or that they'll keep them around until ACA is repealed? So there's not much bipartisanship on the Hill right now, as you can guess. Yeah. So, but one area that they do agree on is that these two taxes must go, that the Cadillac tax must go and the medical device tax must go. There's been numerous studies done by different groups this, which dispute the harm that these taxes do or say that they're really harmful to businesses and unions. So uh, what we've heard from lawmakers is that the taxes were, are going to stay with the ACA. In other words, these taxes won't be repealed until the ACA gets repealed. Okay. Um, I think that's probably um, the talking point that they're using right now. In the Senate, however, uh, Chairman, Hatch, Chairman Arne Hatch from Utah has been saying We'll take them, we'll get rid of them any way we can. If it's health care, if it's tax reform, they have we to don't go. Care. We don't care. So it's some, we're getting different messages from both sides. Yeah. Um, okay. All right. So we're not really sure yet, but they got to go. All right. All right. So it's been said that the House blueprint on tax reform is really the only game in town, implying that there's really no plan B. Um, how accurate is that line of thinking? Um, let's take that one. Sure. Uh, so... I don't think that's that's an accurate representation. I mean, at the, at this point, they are the only, you know, the House Republicans are the only ones that have a concrete uh, set of ideas, a package of ideas. But yeah. we don't have any legislative text yet. So uh, there are other ideas out there as well that are probably in the same realm as this, this blueprint. I mean, we have a there's a progressive consumption tax proposal by Senator Benjamin Cardin from Maryland. Mm -hmm. um, there's also some working groups that the Senate Finance Committee has done, um, not this, pa the, this past uh, Congress, 
um, incorporated a lot of international tax reform ideas, um, some innovation um, tax reform ideas, some of that. So, and then we're also seeing, waiting to see what the what the administration comes up with. I mean, there's a yeah. lot of yeah. sort of different ideas coming from there. Uh, you know, and we don't really know what to believe at this point. So it's still sort of a wait and see game. But you know, give give credit where credit's due. I think the House Republicans are the only ones that do have a comprehensive set of ideas at this point. Yeah, and I like to just um, say that it is a comprehensive set of ideas only. It's not legislation. And so what that means sure. is that industry who are interested in this have to kind of think through the proposal, figure out what they are talking about. Then once they do that, they have to figure out, well, how will my idea of what they're doing affect my business? They take that mm -hmm. idea and bring it back to the to law, to lawmakers and say, hey, we think this is what you meant in the proposal. We think this is how it's going to affect us, so don't do this or do this. So they're still at the very beginning stages of, of what they want to do. And at, at this point, it's only a discussion draft. Yeah. You know, people are thinking like, well, this is this is going to be the, the game. This is more like the pregame. Oh, okay. All right. Well, thank you. So if there was a bill based on the blueprint, because it's just a discussion right now, how popular would it be outside of House leadership? I mean, we know Speaker Ryan likes it. We obviously know that Ways and Means Chairman Brady likes it. But what about everyone else? Um, would that uh, bill get out of committee? Uh, that's a good question. <laughs> I, I really don't know. Uh, uh, um, Dylan just wrote a story in today's tax notes that kind of sort of discusses this disability. So we, I guess we, we can start in, in the Ways and Means Committee itself and then work our way outward. Sure. So, so in, inside the Ways and Means Committee on, on the, the Republican side, there mm -hmm. are several members that have serious reservations about the blueprint. Um, you know, one being, for example, uh, Republican Mike Kelly from Pennsylvania. He has, right. he, he's, his professional background is, uh, he's a car deals dealers so he's looked at you know how that would affect his his sort of prior business and you know he he's has serious concerns so right. there are concerns on the republican side within the committee itself leading some people to speculate that they may not even be able to get a bill out of that uh, out of the ways and means committee so the we could be seeing you know certain changes certain accommodations made in the legislation before you know it's even released wow um, so, so so moving on you know outward you know there's obviously people in the greater house that have concerns but we've mm -hmm. we've definitely heard some some concerns some some senators voice their concerns mm -hmm. both on and off the ways and means committee right. um, you know senator cardin uh, he's a Democrat, but he's right. been very vocal about his opposition to the, right. the, the proposal, the border adjustment tax proposal. Um, another person that's been pretty vocal is uh, Senator David Perdue from uh, Georgia. He's not a he's not a tax writer. He's not under the Senate Finance Committee, but he um, again he has a you know a pretty strong business background. He was the former CEO of Reebok, former CEO of Dollar General. Right. Um, so he's come out pretty strongly against the uh, the House Republican blueprint. So. Right. Um, it, 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 it seems to be that there's you know, a great opposition both mm -hmm. in and outside mm -hmm. of the, the committee. Right. And, and it's not getting rave reviews from Chairman Hatch in the Finance Committee. He's been making comments like that have been drawing questions about how, how expansive it should be, whether or not it has enough support, mm -hmm. you know, how will it work out. He's been raising questions and speeches on the Senate floor and among industry groups about this. So that hasn't helped sell the proposal at all sure. to, to industry groups. And that's a problem, really. You know, I think he's kind of reserving space for the Finance Committee to work its will on tax policy. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that in the, in the House, they may not have enough cover politically to make this bill get out of the House. Because if it, if it looks like when it gets to the Senate, it's going to run into a roadblock, then yeah. it's not going to get out of the committee. Or if it gets out of the committee, then it'll squeak by the House floor. The real problem really lies in what, whether or not this becomes a 10-year bill or a tax policy reform bill. Okay. If, if it's a 10-year bill, which only has Republican support, you can believe that when Democrats get back in power, they're going to try their best to undo everything that the Republicans sure, did. Sure, yeah. So. Okay. All right, so it sounds like it has a long road ahead of it. <laughs> Um, so we've also seen how the Freedom Caucus has exerted their influence in the health care debate. Um, they basically doomed the plan that Speaker Ryan came up with. Do we know where they stand on the cash flow tax and the border adjustment? Uh, so so not, not as a group. I don't think they've, they've come out um, for or against this proposal yet. 
Um, but there are several uh, certain members that have sort of expressed concerns. I mean, Jim Jordan was one of the founding members of the, the House Freedom Caucus, and he has um, been one that has co gone on TV and sort of come out in opposition to the, the border adjustment tax proposal. Uh, other than that, I mean, uh, the, the Freedom Caucus chairman, uh, mm -hmm. Mark Meadows from North Carolina, he has sort of said that we want to be players at that table, at that tax reform table, yeah. mm -hmm. that discussion, but right. um, those priorities I don't think have been decided on yet. Okay. Right. And, and just as a side note, I, I think I read a recent story showing that the, tax, that the Freedom Caucus members were having successful town hall meetings. But they've been hailed as kind of heroes for what they what they did, so that may give them even more control of what happens in, in the house. Sure. And the back. Yeah. Okay. So let's talk about the Senate. We've talked a lot about the House. Where's the Senate these days? Um, they've really been relatively quiet on this whole tax reform saga. Um, we've heard a few senators express specific fears about you know the border adjustment. Um, how widespread are those concerns, and does the F Senate Finance Committee have its own views on tax reform? So the Finance Committee hasn't had any hearings yet. Um, they haven't had any markups yet. They have, okay. there's, there's not a Finance Committee bill. Um, members will tell us that they have had some conversations with the chairman, um, and that staff, the staff members in the Finance Committee are meeting with one another to discuss uh, what's going on. But so far, there's been no proposal. Dill and I have been thinking that maybe Chairman Hatch is going to re bring bring out his corporate integration proposal that he was working right. on last year, but you know that's just an idea. I don't know how true that may be. Um, and most most of the finance committee members they want to have a say. They want to have a say in tax yeah, reform. Absolutely. So the idea that the tax bill from the House is going to come over here and just sail right through, if anyone's thinking that, it's not going to happen. Yeah, I think it's also important to note that that Chairman Brady. Um, in the you know, House Ways and Means Committee. He's been coming over to the Senate mm -hmm. side to meet regularly with Senate Republicans, sort of to keep them informed, keep them up to speed with you know, the, the, the process they're going through and drafting the, the House Republican blueprint. But I think several um, Republicans are still sort of holding, um, you know, holding their tongue, so to speak, because they want to actually have a say, like, like Steve is saying. They really want to have an influence on this. Mm -hmm. This old, you know, ultimately what comes out of, of Congress. Yeah. Okay. Well, there also seems to be a lot of momentum for reducing the corporate statutory rate. Rate, but so many businesses across the country are not organized as you know traditional C corps. Instead, they're you know S corps or they're partnerships or they're LLCs. Um, but none of these entities would necessarily benefit benefit from a corporate uh, rate cut. So do you think that tax reform will happen if the interests of these pass-through entities are not adequately addressed? That's the main dollar question. Yes. You know, because when, when uh, the previous president was in the office, uh, there was this decision that they made that they were not going to be doing uh, personal income tax reform. They were mm -hmm. going to only do corporate. And it, but corporate includes S-corps, it includes pass-throughs, it includes people who are private citizens who file their business income through the personal side of the tax code. And so that issue was never fixed. It was, they never agreed to come up with a solution that treated corporations like they treat um, S-corps and pass-throughs. Okay. And that, that's still a problem. Yeah. No one's come up with a solution to that. Um, and there's, some, there's a school of thought that says, well, if we pass corporate tax reform, how is that going to help Joe Sixpack who needs a job? You know, how is that going to filter down to sure. this person who lives in Montana who may be having a hard time farming? How is yeah. that going to help? So I think um, it's on the Republican Party to sell this plan to average Americans other than just this is a corporate tax reform that's going to help a business. And that business may then somehow have, have a, the ability to hire you. That doesn't may or may not, yeah. It doesn't sell very well. So my guess is that they will probably not um, break into two separate pieces. Um, I think they'll probably try to keep it as one. I'm just, you know, that's my opinion. Okay. I was going to say, it, it, it's, it, you know, politically it's very challenging to sort of address corporate only. Um, sure. Yeah. It, it, right. It just, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't, look it doesn't so trickle, great. it doesn't trickle down to, you know, the average voter. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you both. We really appreciate the update. I know everything's still so much in flux and it's still so confusing, but we appreciate you kind of walking us through it. Sure. And we hope you all will join us next week. Thanks. Thanks.